This is a production of Cornell University. Good day, everybody. Hello. My name is Miles Schwartzax. I'm a graduate student here at the Department of Horticulture. I work with the Urban Horticultural Institute, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, a couple things. First, I'm going to talk about the, the concept of soil health and how this is a, an important way that we're starting to think about soils in this day and age. And I'm also going to talk about some of the research that I've been conducting while I've been here at Cornell, particularly pertaining to soil remediation using a technique we call the scoop and dump method. So I'm going to start off here, like I said, talking about soil health. And when we think about soil health, what we're thinking about is the integration of multiple aspects of soil science. And the three main areas that we're talking about are the physical, the biological, and the chemical. A lot of kind of traditionally in soil testing, uh, we've mostly focused on just the chemical aspects of soils, which are very important aspects. But there's kind of a bigger picture and more to be told with the story. So the concept of soil health is, is finding the, the most important indicators of your soil that are responsive to management, so it can be changed by a practitioner, and also correlate well with plant growth. So here at Cornell, we developed the soil health test out of the crop and soil science department. And what this test does is it's a set of standards, like I just described, that when integrated together, uh, kind of gives you a holistic picture of your soils. And this test is just like any other soil test that you could send a sample into and have results sent back to you. But different from maybe strictly a biological or a chemical test, we cover a, um, a bunch of different aspects. So when we talk about physical, what we're mostly referring to is aggregate stability, water holding capacity, bulk density, texture, and resistance, or compaction is a synonym. When we're talking about biological, mostly what we're thinking about is the soil microorganisms. And we're, this is going to cover organic matter, active carbon, which is just a fraction of total organic matter, as well as soil respiration and protein. And also when we're looking at chemicals, we're going to be primarily looking at pH and as well as our macro and micronutrients. So as I go through this talk today, uh, I'm going to introduce these kind of concepts specifically. Um, and then when we talk about my results, I'm going to give a little more detail about what these actually mean for the practitioner. So when we're talking about soil health, we're talking about looking at specific indicators within uh, specific aspects of our soil. So when we're talking about the uh, physical aspects, we're mainly talking about aggregates, so the actual particles uh, that conglomerate together in your soils, and so size and distribution, as well as stability, how easy they break apart. We're talking about porosity, how, easy, how much air is in your soil and how much space is between your aggregates in your, in your structure. We're talking about bulk density, which specifically refers to weight by volume and is a very good indicator for compaction, which can oftentimes be a large inhibiting factor in our soils, or at least our abilities to be able to uh, grow landscape plants directly in them. Resistance as well, which is a measure, another measure of compaction which we can use a penetrometer, a very easy field tool to use to get a, a, a quick sense of what our compaction looks like. And as well as water holding capacity, how much water is in the soil that is available for your plants, and water infiltratability, so how quickly water can move into your soil. When we move on to the soil biological factors, uh, mostly what we're talking about is the microorganisms that we find in our soil. And these play very, a very important role and have been an area of research that has been gaining more traction and more focus in recent history. But a lot of what the biological factors uh, tend to focus on is the ability for microorganisms to mediate soil nutrients turning over in the soil, as well as contribu them contributing to organic matter. Uh, also, the fixation of nitrogen is a common benefit we see from soil biological factors, as well as detoxification of pollutants and uh, the maintenance of soil structure. 
And as we're kind of thinking about soil biology, uh, the, the kind of mantra that I like to go with or that you tend to hear frequently is that what we're thinking about uh, specifically with nutrients is feeding the soil, uh, not necessarily feeding the plants specifically. And we'll get into this a little bit more as we continue our talk today. And then the third major area is soil chemical. And soil chemical refers uh, to the specific micro and macronutrients that are required for plants to be able to grow and thrive in a given environment, as well as the specific pH, which is also going to be a limiting factor for what kind of plants you can use in that soil, and then cation exchange capacity, which specifically refers to uh, the ability for soil to hold on to nutrients and then allow them to be plant available. So that was a quick summary of what soil health is and the general concepts that go with it. And uh, I'm going to move now into talking a little bit about urban soils and remediation. And if you're unfamiliar with the concept of urban soils, what we're talking about when we're talking about urban soils are soils that are, are non-agricultural, not necessarily naturally forming or not naturally forming, um, and in one way or another are influenced by human impacts and development. So um, a definition that I like to use is non-agricultural man-made surface layer more than 50 centimeters thick that has been produced by a mixing, filling, or contamination of land service in urban and suburban areas. So when we talk about urban soils, what this can really refer to is it could refer to parks, could refer to botanic gardens, could refer to uh, right-of-ways on highways, um, could be talking about urban, like city cores, or even suburban, uh, just like people's yards. So soils that are in one way or another are influenced by human activity. And the reason why we define urban soils in the first place is because there's a number of set characteristics that we tend to find in our urban soil systems. And these characteristics typically uh, tend to have adverse effects on the landscape plants that we wish to put in those landscapes. So what we tend to find in an urban system is high soil bulk density, decreases in organic matter, poor structure, high pH, low water holding capacity, a decrease in aggregate stability, inadequate depth for, uh, for roots to be able to prol proliferate in the soil, and as well as a decrease in microbial biomass and activity. So here at Cornell, we were trying to think of ways of, of how to kind of uh, proactively deal with, with urban soils and some of the challenges that we tend to see with them. So uh, in the Urban Horticultural Institute, in Nina Bassick's lab, we focused on developing this technique known as the scoop and dump technique of soil remediation. And the practice is, is relatively straightforward. What you do is you come in with compost into a compacted or disturbed urban soil site and you apply that compost at a rate of six to eight inches on the top of the soil surface. And then you come in with either a, a backhoe or mini excavator or you can even do it with shovels and what you do is you, you physically use your backhoe to fracture and scoop down to the soil reaching into the subsoil. You lift it up that soil, shake it, and drop it. And what this does is it creates a heterogeneous mixture of compost and soil. And after that point, you can either rototill it or just iron rake it over to create a smooth planting surface. And then you apply mulch. And what you have after this, at this point is a planting bed that is now uh, you can directly put plants into. Uh, mostly we've used this with shrubs and tree species. And this is just a few pictures of, of what it kind of looks like. You can do this technique either by using a backhoe or by using, uh, if you have a lot of um, help, you can do it by shovels, but it's accessible. And you can use it to either create large planting beds or very small planting beds if you want to just put one tree in or just a few shrubs, or if you want to renovate um, a, a large area. And on the Cornell campus, we've been doing the scuba dump practice for the last 14 years now. As a part of Nina Bassick's uh, Creating the Urban Eden Woody Plant ID and Landscape Establishment class, every year the class will create a new garden on campus. And when they design this garden and then eventually install it, they've been using the scoop and dump technique. 
And we've used this technique in, in a various number of places. This is a picture of outside of a man library when we were doing construction a few years ago. And you can see that the, the landing area right in front of the building. Here's another angle of that, of what a, a, a construction landscape looked like. And this is what the landscape looks like today, where we've come in, we've used the scoop and dump technique to remediate the soil. And now it is a, a place where it went from highly compacted and impacted from construction to a place where we're having our landscape plants thrive and survive. So we wanted to kind of look at the scoop and dump technique and learn a few things about it. We wanted to find how changes in soil quality based on soil health had changed in response to doing the scoop and dump technique. Uh, and we also wanted to look at this to see how, since we had 12 years worth of gardens or 14 years at this point, uh, we were able to see over time also how changes were made. So we selected three sites where this technique had been applied and three sites directly adjacent to it. This way we could do a, a control type experiment where we had plants growing, or so we had soils that had been developed by the scoop and dump technique, and then we had areas that were close by that had received similar impacts, but um, had not gone through the same remediation. So we went to these sites and we took soil cores. Um, we took three of them that were about this size and we took these cores and we extracted samples directly from our scoop and dump soils and then at equal depth we also took them in our unamended. And we went just below our mulch level because as I mentioned when you do the scoop and dump technique you add mulch every year as you would in any kind of uh, landscape bed establishment. And we selected our unamended or control soils at the same depth as we found our scoop and dump soils. So I'm going to go through the results that we found of our study. And as I discuss these, I'm also going to discuss uh, some of the soil quality indicators and what they mean. So we get a sense of not just what happened, uh, but giving a, a broader picture of soil health. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is aggregate stability. And what we're talking about when we're referring to aggregate stability is uh, essentially the soil aggregates, these large particles um, that have conglomerated together, and their ability to resist destruction. And the destructive forces that we apply on them are water. There's two ways you can look at this. You can either look at this by flooding, uh, how much the aggregates break apart when inundated with water, or you can look at it uh, as we do in the soil health lab using a rain infiltrometer here which simulates a very heavy rainstorm event. And essentially, the, the more stable your aggregates, the less they break apart, uh, the better that is for your soil structure, and just generally uh, creating a kind of more agreeable environments for our, our plant to put our plants directly into. So when we looked at the scoop and dump versus our controlled soils, what we found is that our scoop and dump soils had uh, 70, 2% aggregate stability. And if you compare this to our unamended, we see that our unamended is at about 34%. And so just by doing the scoop and dump technique, coming in and incorporating organic matter and physically fracturing the soil and mulching over their site, we saw that we had almost double the amount of aggregate stability. Next, we have organic matter. And what we're talking about when we're talking about organic matter is it's primarily carbon that is derived from a living source. So whether this be plant or animal residues uh, or microorganisms that we're finding in the, in the soil, um, it's a little more involved than that, but as a basic sense, that's what we're referring to. And organic matter is a very important component of our soils. Uh, I think most people kind of know that the, it tends to be the more organic matter you have in the soils, uh, it, it improves structure and it certainly is beneficial for uh, cation exchange capacity, therefore the ability for soil to hold on to nutrients. So in a, in a functioning ecosystem where we want our plants to th thrive and survive, organic matter is a very important indicator to look at. And on average, when we look across these sites, what we see is that our scoop and dump soils, we have 8.43% organic matter compared to our unamended that is at 3.23. Uh, so almost three times your organic matter after doing this incorporation which makes sense since we're adding compost, we're adding a lot of organic matter, uh, but it's good to see this. Next, there's active carbon. 
And this is kind of a, a, a newer test that some people may not be as familiar with. But what we're talking about when we talk about active carbon is essentially it's uh, the fraction of your organic matter that is available for soil microorganisms to consume and to use as a food source. So active carbon is a biological indicator and it really is um, a little different than our total organic matter because that refers to all of, the, all of the organic matter we find. Active carbon is just a fraction of it and is this food source for our soil microorganisms which play mediating roles in our nutrient turnovers. And what we see when we looked at active carbon is that our active carbon, we are up around uh, 1,022 parts per million, compare this to our unamended at 361. And so almost, uh, we have more than three times the amount of active carbon in our scoop and dump soils. Moving over to water holding capacity. Water holding capacity specifically refers to the amount of water that is being held uh, in your soil that is available to plants. So on one end of the extreme, you have field capacity, which is the amount of water that's held in the soil when you've had a large rain event and uh, just due to gravity alone, the water is drained out of it. The amount of water that is held in the soil after that draining event is known as field capacity. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have what's known as permanent wilting point. And permanent wilting point refers to the point where uh, the amount of water in the soil is no longer available to plants. So plants cannot pull it up from their roots, um, and therefore the, the plant will start to have a drought response at this point. So water holding capacity is between these two extremes. So this is very important, as you'd imagine, for thinking about irrigation and also thinking about uh, just general maintenance of plants in the landscape. And what we see with available water holding capacity is that uh, in our scoop and dump, we ended up with 0 0.23. Well, you compare this to our unamended, which is 0 0.15. And these differences may not look as large as some of our other indicators, uh, but statistically this is quite significant. Uh, and we see that our, our scoop and dump soils do hold uh, significantly more water. So the next indicator I'm going to talk about is potentially mineralizable nitrogen. And what this indicator refers to specifically is the conversion of nitrogen from an organic form into an inorganic form. So going from plant unavailable to plant available. And what I put, have up here on picture of this slide is the full nitrogen cycle. And I'm not going to go into full detail about this, but this is just kind of one, one component of it. Potentially mineralizable nitrogen is another biological indicator since this is mediated by soil microorganisms and also since nitrogen is such an important uh, element for or nutrient for plants to use, an important one to look at. And when we looked at potentially mineralizable nitrogen in our scoop and dump compared to our unamended soils, what we found is that we had almost 10 times the amount of potentially mineralizable nitrogen compared to our unamended. So uh, 27.53 parts per million compared to 3.11 in our unamended. Next, we looked at resistance using a pentrometer. A uh, pentrometer, for people who aren't familiar with it, is, is this instrument right here. It's pretty straightforward. It has a pressure gauge on one side and a measuring bar in the middle. And what you do is you take this and you can push it into your soil at a consistent rate and measure at what point uh, your soils reach a pressure of 300 PSI or higher. And the significance of 300 PSI is that that is the kind of point in your soils where uh, roots can no longer proliferate in a compacted soil. So you know if you're below that threshold um, that your roots are going to be able to grow fine. If you're above it, then you're going to, you have a compaction issue and you need to address it one way or another. Uh, there are some limitations to using this instrument. It's best to use it directly uh, a short time after it, it rains, especially if you're going to be doing a lot of different sites because soil moisture can make a difference in how you read it. But it's a great way to just get a, a quick estimate of what the compaction looks like in your soil and why we talk about it in terms of soil health. And so when we looked at our scoop and dump compared to our unamended, what we found is that in our scoop and dump, we could go down to 9.74 inches before re reaching our root limiting PSI uh, 
compared to our unamended, which was at 3.44 inches. So we had three times the rooting volume or depth available to us that, that plants could therefore um, grow, explore, and use. Next, we looked at bulk density. And as I, I discussed before, what bulk density is is a, a measure of weight by volume. And this is another indicator that's important to consider um, when looking specifically at compaction. It is um, a little bit more telling than using the uh, resistance measure or the pentrometer measure, um, and pretty straightforward to take. Um, but we use these rings typically to measure bulk density. And we'll hammer these into the soil, get them kind of flush so we know how much volume's in here specifically, dry them out, and then weigh that. And what we can tell with bulk density, just like we can tell with resistance, is that we know, depending on texture, that once you get above a specific bulk density, you start to have uh, trouble having roots grow and proliferate in your soil. So in sands, it's 1.75 grams per centimeter cubed compared to silts and clay, which is around 1.4. And these numbers may not mean a lot right now, but as I discussed bulk density several times throughout this talk, uh, there's gonna be, it's gonna start to make more sense. And so what we found in our scoop and dump soils is that um, we were at 0 0.89 grams per centimeter cubed, which is well below that 1.4 threshold. So regardless of texture, we saw that by doing this process that we were able to reduce our bulk density and create a medium where roots are going to have a much easier time growing. Compare this to our unamended, which is up at 1.47. And uh, depending on texture, you're kind of just getting to that root, lim root limiting range. So after we did our first kind of study where we looked at scuba dump soils in a compare and contrast um, setting, we also wanted to look at how did these soils change over time. So we selected a cross section of 12 years, and we selected six sites out of those that represented that time frame. And when we looked at this in chrono sequence, what we found out is that over time, our bulk density decreased. We found that our potentially mineralizable nitrogen, our nitrogen that is being converted from in organic to an inorganic form, also significantly increased over time, as well as our active carbon, uh, the, the portion of our, of our total organic matter that is available for microorganisms to use as a food source. And it was really exciting to see this, because um, when we did our first study, what we could see is that, yes, by going in and doing the scoop and dump practice, we improved, we, we approved, improved soil quality almost immediately. And that was the first piece of data. What we saw when we looked at this over time is that um, by going in and doing this once and then mulching every year, that there is an, uh, an increased benefit that keeps on uh, going after we've used this technique. Uh, active carbon, as well as potentially mineralizable nitrogen are both biological indicators. So it gives us a good clue into what's going on with the, micro the microbes in our soil and their ability to, to mediate soil health, uh, and as well as this bulk density, which continues to create an environment where after we've established these plants, they're going to have a lot easier time growing. So this is all very exciting to see. And uh, what we wanted to do next was say, all right, we've seen that we've improved our soil quality and that's a great thing. But we also want to see how plants respond to these changes in soil quality. So we set up a soil container study where we went out again to our scoop and dump sites and our, and our unamended sites. And we took large cores, PVC cores, that we hammered into the ground and pulled out. And we were then able to take these soils, bring them into a growth chamber and grow plants in them specifically to see uh, how the plants responded to this improved environment. And we were able to look at a number of different factors. But first what we did when we took these, we, we used a ficus benjamina, which is uh, known as a tropical street tree. Uh, we did this because we were running this experiment in the winter, but it is oftentimes uh, a plant you do find in the urban environment in uh, tropical and subtropical regions. 
And so the first things we looked at after growing and establishing these ficus benjamina was how, um, just what were the gross plant growth response. So we see here that in our scoop and dump soils, um, compared to our unamended, ficus that were grown in there had um, significantly more leaf area. Leaf area was the first indicator that we looked at, up at 933 centimeters squared, compared to our unamended, which was at 578 centimeters squared. So significantly more leaf area was put on by the plants growing just in the scoop and dump soil. When we destructively harvested and, and extracted the roots and the shoots from the plants, what we found is that um, we had significantly more dry weight of roots for, for plants growing in our scoop and dump soil compared to our unamended. And again, these, these differences do not look giant, but statistically they are significantly different as well as the dry weight of shoots. We also had significantly more uh, shoot growth compared in our, un in our scoop and dump soils compared to our unamended. So again, like in our last study, we also looked at bulk density, this measure of weight by volume. And what we found again is that our scoop and dump soils are, were at this 0 0.97 uh, range, which is again well below that 1.4 threshold compared to our unamended soils, which are up in the 1.68 on average range. And uh, we're starting to see limitations in the soil based on that. So what we did is we did a linear regression where we looked at bulk density by our uh, dry weight of shoots. So shoots referring to everything from the soil line up. So leaves and any woody biomass that was developed. And what we see is a very strong relationship here of in the blue, we have our scoop and dump. We have uh, more shoots on, on the axis here and as well as higher bulk densities. So what we see is a very clear relationship where we're actually looking at um, the lower all bulk, all bulk density is correlating very strongly with more dry weights of shoots. And we can see in our unamended soil that uh, this line right here is our 1.4 threshold where you start seeing root limiting bulk densities. Uh, they're all kind of clustered down. And when we look at the dry weight of roots as well, we see a very similar pattern of our reduced bulk density correlating with more root growth, as well as our leaf area. We see the same pattern yet again, where we have strong correlations with reductions in bulk density and increases in leaf area. So when we did this uh, destructive harvest after we had um, pulled the plants out of the soils, containers that they had been growing in, uh, there was a few observations that were, that were made that weren't so easy to necessarily quantify. And one of the big things that we saw was just, was just where the roots were exploring in these containers and how much more um, you know, biomass they're putting on. So this is a pretty clear picture of our scoop and dump roots. You can see um, a lot more, a much larger root system developing here compared to our unamended, which uh, is just not nearly, not nearly as dense. And what was interesting when we looked specifically at where the roots were in the container is that in our unamended soils, plants that were growing in our soils that had not been remediated, uh, that had this higher bulk density, what we would typically see is that uh, where we planted the ficus in the container, there would be roots that were growing um, right where we stuck the plug in. And then oftentimes what the roots would do is they'd grow up from that plug across the top of the container and then down the sides. And so what the roots were actually doing in this, in this scenario was they were not exploring the majority of the soil volume in these unamended soils, but finding a way to kind of follow the path of least resistance and looking for an area where they could grow and escape. So it's a very similar pattern that you see here where, where you kind of, they came down in the you kind of came down the middle where you planted the plug and then they'd escape off to the side. If you compare this to what we see in our scoop and dump soils, the roots growing in our scoop and dump soils had the ability to uh, really grow throughout the full amount of the soil volume. They'd explore between those aggregates and those different airspace. Um, and they, the, the volume, they wouldn't do the same escaping pattern. They would just grow throughout the whole container. And even when you tried to break the soils apart, uh, 
in your unamended soils, when you start to break the roots and the soil apart, the soil would just kind of fall away. In our scoop and dump soils, you'd be, you really have to work really hard to, to actually um, free the soil from the roots to be able to get this. So this was all exciting to see. And kind of in, in summary, um, I talked about early on that some of the issues that we see in, in, in urban soils and its characterization. And by coming in and doing the scoop and dump process, we've been able to improve the majority of them, pretty much everything except for the, the high pH. So by doing the scoop and dump process, we were able to decrease our bulk densities, increase our organic matter, improve our soil structure, increase our water holding capacity, uh, increase our aggregate stability, improve our soil microorganism community, and as well as create more soil uh, volume for, for plants to be able to explore. So here are a few shots of locations where we have used this technique and what some of the gardens look like today. Okay. So I'm going to take the last uh, little bit of time in this talk to talk about some of the, the practicalities of implementing this technique. And the first thing I want to show is just a, a cost estimate of some of the parameters that we're looking at if we want to actually implement this. The, the main costs associated with the scoop and dump technique are your compost, uh, as well as getting a, a backhoe machine in to use. So depending on where you work, if you work in a place that already has access, you, if you make your own compost, this cost can be eliminated or decreased, as well as if you work in a place where you have access to, the, for, to a machine, then uh, the rental costs that I've projected here are not gonna be an issue. As I mentioned before, it is possible to do this technique also just uh, with shovels and by hand. But a very important aspect of the scoop and dump technique is, is doing the physical fracturing of the soil. It's not simply adding compost. Um, the compost with the mixing is what creates this soil mixture, and that's where we find the benefits here. So I just want to make that point kind of clear. So estimates on an 100 square foot bed, depending if you want to go depending on your depth of compost you want to apply. If we're talking about, uh, about the six inch range, which would be fairly typical, that would take about just under two yards of compost. Um, and I estimated in this measurement for the Bobcat mini excavator to be rented for a three hour period. So what we're talking about for a hundred square foot bed is about $212. Scale that up to an 1,000 square foot bed, which would be a, a fairly large size bed, but uh, certainly something if you're planning a large installation is for the six inch depth, you're looking somewhere around $725. Again, it's important to think about uh, where your compost is coming from, if what kind of source and how expensive you can, that is gonna be as well as the machine use. But the one kind of point when we do think about costs that I wanna bring up is just the idea um, that we know that this technique improves your soils over the long term. So you have to think about it more in terms of making an initial investment, and then over time, it's gonna to continue to pay off. And this is gonna be particularly pronounced if you're working in a, uh, at a site that has had plant failure in the past. Um, by using this technique, you're gonna hopefully be able to decrease on plant failure and therefore be saving money uh, by not having to replace those plants nearly so often or hopefully not at all. And when it does come to selecting plants to be putting in this bed, uh, what we talk about in the Urban Horticultural Institute is always selecting your plants based on your site's limitation. And the Urban, Horticul the Urban Horticultural Institute has a number of different resources available to help you figure out what your site limitations are. And I'm just gonna talk about them kind of briefly here. So the first one we oftentimes consider is to be cold hardiness. Uh, and most people are familiar with this. There's very good maps by the USDA, which will tell you what zone you're in. And you always wanna select your plant first on a, in, based on zone so you know that it can thrive 
on the minimum temperature that you find in your area. The next thing you consider is soil pH. And you're either going to have, um, a, you're either going to have very, you could have very acidic soils or very basic soils. Um, and based on this, again, there's not much we can do except for select the right plants that are going to like that environment. You can make changes to soil pH. That is um, a possibility. Uh, but oftentimes, when we think about it in the urban setting, a uh, cost that we do not tend to uh, incur because we don't actually tend to change the soil's uh, pH. It's easier to select a plant that can deal with the kind of pH range you're in instead of going out and uh, buying a lot of amendments. Light is the next indicator. You're either going to have full sun, which is six hours or more in a given day, part shade, which is going to be less than that, or full shade, which is maybe at most an hour of light in a day. The next area that we consider is to be moisture, which is uh, how much water is going to be at your site. So whether you have a site that frequently floods or frequently drains very fast and actually stays very kind of dry, or if you're lucky enough to have uh, something that can kind of do both, it will uh, infiltrate water quickly, but also hold on to it. And as well as salt exposure. And this is uh, something that uh, we see particularly in a lot of institutional type settings or as well as on tr in transportation type areas where you're either getting salt exposure uh, from de-icing salts um, or salt soils if you're in a part of the country where salinity is an issue in your soils. So we have a great resource available to us um, here at Cornell. We've got the Woody Plant Database. And uh, What's great about the Woody Plant Database is you can go onto it and figure out your site's limitations, plug those into our database, and what will happen is it will generate a list of plants that are appropriate for your environment. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these assessments. Most of these assessments of site limitation you can do on your own in a pretty straightforward kind of a way, and then you can use the Woody Plant Database to find plants that are going to be um, that are going to work for your landscape. Another resource available to people is the Site Assessment Checklist. And this uh, comes from a book written by the Urban Horticultural Institute, which is Recommended Urban Trees, Site Assessment, and Tree Selection for Stress Tolerance. So similar to the, um, the database I was referring to a moment ago. And in this book, it's free and available on our website online. Uh, but you can go through, and they also have a checklist where you can actually go through each of your specific limitations and um, kind of check them off for a given site, and then you can use that information to then select plants after that. So as I mentioned before, I've talked a lot about the concept of soil health, what it is. Um, Cornell has a soil health testing lab, so you can actually take soils and collect them and send them into the lab and they can go through a battery of tests, many of the ones I've talked about today as well as um, some other ones that I haven't focused on as much. And for $85 you can get a full package where you get a really good picture of what's going on. And I would say that this is a great uh, tool to use specifically if you're uh, doing a new management technique on a piece of, on a piece of land and you kind of want to see how your soils respond over, over time. Uh, most soil testing, it's always you always want to do it when before you're about to establish a new site, or if you're trying to understand what's going on with a site specifically. If you're having um, issues with with some of your plant failure, or you're just trying to get a better sense, but it's also something that's good to test over time. And that's what's really convenient about the soil health test is that it is responsive to management. So if you test one year maybe two or three years down the line you can test again and you can kind of see how your soils have changed in response to your management. Uh, there's a few add-ons if you're concerned about heavy metals you can add that onto the test as well as soluble salts if that is uh, another concern for you as well. Uh, I would say if you don't want to go and get the full package for $85 you can also send in and get uh, what we call a la carte or specific tests done and I would say if you're going to get a minimum set of tests, you should get your texture looked at, you should get your organic matter looked at, and you should get your pH looked at. Since these are all, at least texture and pH is something that you're probably not going to be addressing um, in changing on your site, 
but will be very informative when you want to select plants for that landscape. And then there's actually a whole bunch of tests that you can do on your own, uh, the do-it-yourself assessments. And these are bulk density, resistance with a penetrometer, uh, pH, and then some of the site limitations which I was discussing before. So texture, light, hardiness, salt exposure, and moisture. So I'm going to just talk about some of doing some of these assessments yourself. The first thing I'm going to talk about is specifically bulk density. Uh, bulk density, as I've mentioned many times, is a measurement of weight by volume. Uh, if you're doing a lot of soil testing, it's wise to invest in a, in a soil uh, a can that you can use specifically to test these. And it's a pretty straightforward process. Um, if you don't want to buy one of these, you can also cut off two ends of a soup can. Anything that you know the specific size on, or you can measure and figure out the specific size. Uh, so what I want to show here, briefly touch on, is the actual technique of taking a bulk density measurement. And it's a, a pretty straightforward process. Uh, what you really need for it uh, is just a few things. You need a wood block, you need a, a can, and you need a hammer, as well as an oven at home and a, a, a cookie sheet. And this is a specific uh, soil core that soil sam people who are doing a lot of soil sampling will use. Uh, if you don't want to purchase one of these, you're only doing maybe one or two sites, you can also use something like a soup can as well. You, of course, want to be careful not to cut yourself. But anything that you can measure the height and as well as the diameter so you can calculate the volume afterwards. Uh, bulk density is a specific measurement of weight by volume and therefore tells us our compaction in our soil. So the technique is pretty, pretty straightforward. We'll go out to a site and um, we'll, if it's turfed, what we'll do is we'll slice the turf layer off and then we'll come in and we'll take our core, put it on the soil, on the top of the soil, come in with our block and our hammer, and hammer it down until you, your soil level just, just reaches the top of the can. At this point, you can smooth it out, and then you're going to come in with a trowel, trowel underneath it. It's good to get a cap, but if you don't want to get a cap, you can use anything that's flat. So cap one side of it, flip it over, smooth the soil out as well. And this way you know now you have a known amount of volume of soil within this canister. You can take this soil, push it into a bag. You take that bag of soil, bring it home, put it on a, put it on a cookie sheet, put it in your oven at 200 degrees for two or three hours until all the, so until all the moisture has evaporated out. You can take that soil out, allow it to dry, and then weigh it. And since you know the volume of your cylinder and the weight, you can then figure out your weight by volume, and therefore you know your bulk density. Uh, the next kind of do-it-yourself assessment is looking at soil resistance with a penetrometer. Uh, these are available from Cornell directly. You can borrow them for a week at a time, where we'll ship them out to you. And you can get one of these penetrometers um, if you wanted to look at compaction across a lot of sites. And the, the main thing with these is that it's, it's best to do it um, kind of after it's rained, a short period afterwards. But if, as long as you assess all your soils within a short time frame, so the soils don't dry out too much, you can get a pretty good uh, relative indicator to each other. Uh, but like I mentioned before, they're pretty straightforward in how they work. You've got a pressure gauge on one side, and uh, this is graduated, so there's actually measurements on this um, pole specifically. And as you push this down into the soil, what you're going to see on the top is increased pressure. The only caveat other than moisture on this is that there's two different tips you can get. There's a 3 4 inch tip and a half inch tip. Um, and you only need to use the bigger one if you're working in very sandy soils. Next is texture, texture by feel. Um, this is different than the way that the, if you sent soils into the lab that they would look at texture, but there's a number of resources available that are just flow charts where you can collect a small amount of your soil with a little bit of water and you can, you can go through the practice of, um, of assessing those soils and getting a texture simply by feel. This is a common uh, field assessment technique that a lot of uh, 
farmers or land care practitioners or and certainly soil scientists will, will develop so they can understand what the textures of their soil without going through the full test. So at the bottom of this pay slide, there's also a link available where you can find a texture by feel, but there are a few out there. The next one that you can look at uh, is, is pH. pH is another um, indicator that is very easy to assess on your own. Uh, at Cornell, we sell pH testing kits. They come in two different ranges. They come in a wide range as well as a standard range. Um, your standard range being from pH of 5 to 7.2, and your, and your wider range being from 4 to 8.6. Uh, and then we also offer one that's in the low range, which is from 4 to 6.2 pH. So you can buy a single one of these boxes for $12.50. It will last you a very long time. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward process of taking a small amount of soil, placing it into these, into these dishes, and then using the different reagents and a colorimetric scheme to be able to tell what your range is in. So particularly if you want to do a lot of sites across your campus, you could um, buy one of these kits for $12.50 and you'll be able to do a lot of assessments. Um, you compare this to the cost of doing the pH test on its own if you send it to the lab, which is $12 for one test. So if you think you're going to be doing uh, even testing more than one site, it's, in, it's worth it to invest within the pH kit. And you can also follow the links on this PowerPoint to get more information. There's a few extra slides here that are just at the end of the presentation. The, the first that I want to share with people is a general workflow of what you might want to be thinking about if you want to implement the scoop and dump technique. And the first consideration you want to think about is whether you have a site that is just uh, topsoil is present and it's just compacted or impacted. Um, you can follow this workflow and determine the best, how much compost to apply and at what stage. Uh, you can also use this technique if you are on a construction site where you've stripped the topsoil and have it stockpiled somewhere else. You can use the scoop and dump technique on that lower subsoil level um, to improve your soil quality uh, when you reapply your topsoil at the end. And a lot of work um, by Susan Day has focused specifically on this technique of removing topsoil and putting it back on along with the scoop and dump technique uh, or the profile rehabilitation as she calls it. This last slide is a slide of just some basic measurements for understanding bulk density. Um, it just gives you the equation for finding the volume of a cylinder, which is a very simple equation and one you need to uh, know to figure out the specific bulk density of a soil. And last but not least, there is some additional resources and links here to the Urban Horticultural Institute. If you'd like to reach out to me or any of my colleagues for further questions uh, or conversations, as well as the Cornell Soil Health Lab, if you'd like to get uh, the test done or any specific components of the test, and the Cornell Nutrient Analysis Lab, if you would like to do comprehensive testing of um, either composts or soils for nutrients. And with that, I wanna thank you all for joining me today. And uh, please feel free to reach out in the future if you have questions or would like to learn more about the scoop and dump technique and rehabilitation of urban soils. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.